Good evening. I'm Baban Mirshab, Dean College of Business and Information Systems. On behalf of my colleagues in the college, it is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to the eighth annual LTU Presidential Symposium. This year's event is sponsored by the College of Business Information Technology. Founded in 1939, the college offers degree programs at both undergraduate and graduate in business and information technology. The college is accredited by Association to Advanced Collegiate Schools of Business. AACSB accreditation represents the highest standard of achievement for business schools. Less than one third of US business schools are accredited. Only 15% of business schools worldwide are accredited by AACSB. At this time, I may, may I ask my colleagues in the College of Business Information Technology to stand up to be recognized? <laughs> the pride they take in their work is truly inspiring. Before inviting President Madgill to give his welcome speech, let me briefly give you a bio of him. Dr. Verinder Madgill has served as president and CEO of Lawrence Technological University since July 1, 2012. He is overseeing a period of significant growth of LTU's enrollment, fundraising, and community outreach. Campus facility growth and improvements include construction of a third and fourth student residence hall. Dr. Madgill also has led or championed research and scholarship traditions at LTU, emphasizing undergraduate basic and applied research. President Motgill's education and professional training include Harvard Institute for Educational Management 2006, postdoctoral Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, PhD in biochemistry from Banaras University, the most famous institution in India. President Modgill's significant work has appeared in some 250 publications, including 110 papers or reviews, book chapters, and 112 conference proceedings and abstracts. He has edited numerous books. His research on steroid hormone action was supported by grants from the National Institute of Health. It is now my distinct pleasure to invite Dr. Madgill, President and CEO of Lawrence Technological University. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Mirshab. Uh, you know, he is very generous with his time and his compliments to everyone, student, faculty, and everyone he meets. He's a good man and a good leader for College of Business and Information Technology. And I extend my greetings to all of you on behalf of this great institution that was founded a legendary time when 50% unemployment in the country, banks were closed, people had lost their job during Great Depression. So in 1932, our founding president was invited by Henry Ford and Edsel Ford to start a new institution. So the workers of Ford Motor Company building Model T at that plant could be well educated. And at, this is how we started as LIT, Lawrence Institute of Technology in 1932. What is very interesting is many of you read the magazine Forbes uh, by Steve Ford, who is the managing editor. Forbes grandfather, who started the Ford magazine in 1917, he wrote an editorial on the founding of LIT. And he predicted that this institution, which will believe in theory and practice, will be the future business incubator and business accelerator model. And how true he was, just recently, just a few days ago, on our campus, we inaugurated the first business accelerator on our campus. I think that requires some appreciation. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Lawrence Stack theory and practice education has won laurels, and they are very embedded in actual changing, impacting the, the, the communities, universities, corporations. Uh, I cannot name enough alumni who have been transformers of the societies in which they live and work, from Steve Ballmer, who led Microsoft or Bill Gates, to Al Taubman, who is the pioneer of shopping malls, to our alumni who design things that you use, uh, uh, places you use every day, be it Service at Mall or Oakland County Airport, or if you ball, love, ball game lovers, the Oakomerica Park, and Fox Theater's renovation, all done by Lorna Streck graduates. So would you help me? We have many alumni in this room who are themselves very transformative in the community, and we're so proud of them. Will the alumni of Lorna Streck rise and be recognized? <laughs> Thank you very much. We have four colleges at Lawrence Tech, and each college has eminence in its own sphere. And this program, as Dean Marsha mentioned, is being hosted by College of Business and Information Technology. We have many students here. And I want to bring to your attention that the environment that we live and breathe and see will shape the future of this planet. The students here in this room or in this hall are going to shape the planet that we live in or the earth that we walk on because they are the custodians of the future of our generations and those to come. But what we are here today is a different thing how electric vehicles will reshape urban planning. I think these three issues are intertwined, all require our attention, and some, in some cases sacrifices, so that we get to the promised land of a healthy, clean living that our forefathers, foremothers, uh, work very hard to give it to us. And this particular issue is so important because we are in motor city, we, have, we are the pioneers in automobile, and there are issues whether we need autonomous vehicles or electric vehicles, or some old folks like me, they can drive just old cars and they're happy with it. <laughs> but the issue will be, as we evolve as a community, you never go backward, you have to go forward. So this issue today before you is one in that direction that we need to address, analyze, critique, and see which best suits our needs which best suits not the people who can walk and jog and run, but those who are unable to do so, those who are limited in uh, their mobility within the home or communities and need some assistance, be it autonomous or a train, which saves money because a lot of young people, mom, dad, both work, cannot pay the bills. For them, saving on gas, very important. So electric cars do bring that dimension to us. And Lawrence Tech and everything we do is is the, in the front of this. The College of Engineering, Architecture, Business, uh, the College of Business Administration, as we called them before, Business and Information Technology, had graduates which have been very impactful, including the philosopher, the think leaders from College of Arts and Sciences. Imagine a graduate of business school, former management school, college, and a graduate of engineering college both brothers graduated from Lawrence Tech, started a company called FuTech, which is short for future technology. They started this company of building sensors in Irvine, California. And this is just one peek into the impact of Lawrence Tech graduates. And this is many years ago, this is the time when uh, NASA was looking at sending uh, information on Mars to put uh, some, some vehicle on Mars, but they needed some sensor that could detect uh, signs of life, water or ice, or could withstand the temperature of Mars, minus 200, 300 degrees. So our boys in California, they did it. They prepared two sensors which were on Curiosity rover, and they were on the planet Mars for years and years. This is what I say, the Lawrence Tech students, graduates, and alumni, some alumni who are sitting here right now, not only they have mastered this planet, now they're interplanetary. We are on Mars as well. So with that, uh, you have many more conversation to listen to, conversation good to have, 
We have outstanding speakers and a great moderator. So it is a treat to watch as well as to listen. Thank you and so much appreciation for you being here on a night some people are home watching something else. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask my good old friend, Dr. David Theolis, to stand to the podium and introduce speakers. David? OK, good evening. And first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Mogul and Dr. Mershab, for those opening remarks. The topic of electric vehicles and urban planning can be examined from many different angles including battery technology, charging infrastructure, and mobility. I am honored to introduce a distinguished panel to help us understand the intersection of these issues. On a combined basis, our panel has more than 70 years of experience ranging in fields from transportation, environmental science, energy, and economics. I will now introduce, give a brief introduction of each of our uh, panelists. Our first panelist will be Alex Kuros. Alex is a lead charging architect at General Motors, where he develops partnerships with key stakeholders, such as EV charging companies, utility companies, and policymakers to find the best customer solutions. Prior to his current position, he served as Smart Cities Chief at Maven. Alex has a bachelor's degree in natural resource management and an MBA, both from the University of Michigan. Our second speaker will be Mark De Laverne, who serves as Chief of Mobility Innovation for Mayor Mike Duggan, where he works to bring new mobility services and technologies to Detroit residents. In 2018, this included a first mile, last mile pilot with Lyft, expanding car sharing to Detroit neighborhoods, overseeing the deployment of 1,200 e-scooters, as well as an autonomous shuttle service. Prior to his current position, Mark worked as a consultant with cities across North America on transportation projects. He is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Our next speaker will be uh, Sarah Nielsen. She is a director in the corporate strategy group at CSM Energy. Her team assesses industry and technology trends such as electric vehicles and smart grids that will define the utility of the future. Sarah holds a bachelor's degree from, in biology from the University of Dayton and an MBA and a master's degree in environmental science from Yale University. Serving at, as today's moderator, Elaine Buckberg is chief economist at General Motors. Prior to joining GM, she was a principal at the Brattle Group, a global economic consultancy. Elaine pre uh, previously served in positions at the US Treasury Department, near economic consulting, the International Monetary Fund, and Morgan Stanley. Elaine holds a PhD in economics from MIT and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and English Literature from Yale University. Before I hand the program over to Elaine, please give the panel a round of applause. Um, the, and let me echo the comments of thanks for inviting us and, and having us here. I will make one correction, President. Uh, we are all stewards of this earth not just the students in this room, which means, I'll be blunt, we all got to get off our ass and try to make of changes that we expect to happen. So that goes for you grandparents in here as well as you students, um, and most importantly, me, right? As Elaine sort of alluded to, our, our team is really thinking about how do we put these things out there? How do we bring them to market? How do we do it in a very successful way across uh, different activities? So. Folks have seen this, you know, this is sort of the GM's sort of general vision. I've had a really fun luxury of wearing two of the coolest titles within General Motors, um, both as a Smart Cities Chief, and then as a couple weeks ago, uh, reaffirming my commitment to electrification, joining uh, a team that I helped create many years back around uh, being the lead architect for infrastructure. But what's neat about this is th these are all very much 
woven concepts, right? Safety of the vehicle is related to congestion, congestion is related to emissions, and really how we rethink our transportation systems really come at the core of it. And I'm looking forward to, as somebody who's worn both of these hats, trying to help combine it on the panel today to really sort of think very dynamically on how do you address these. Well, you can see I come from the engineering world, so this is what Elaine just said in far fewer words, um, and, and uh, because we can't spell those big words like ubiquitous. But the, the point being is we really have to get these right, right? And at least three of them are really directly within our control uh, related to the range and the price and the sort of form of the vehicle. And one of them arguably is in our control, but I imagine it much more of how do we build a normal system related to infrastructure development, right? How do we start solving a much longer play of how to put these pieces together in such a way it's sustainable. It's sustainable for the grid, it's sustainable for those using it, um, and it's sustainable for those who want to get into this business and make it work. And a lot of what we've been doing is thinking about that. Lane alluded to this, I'll give you a little bit more of a sort of a view of how do you create a sustainable vehicle platform, right, that, that makes money and really addresses what consumers are thinking about. And it's really around building this architecture that, that can transform it. She just alluded to again, really important, SUV segment is a big deal. Most of us, if we're not buying cars and we were using Maven and other car sharing stuff, when we do enter into the space, we're usually entering it because we have a family, right? We're sort of getting out of that urban mindset and, and now going, all right, I gotta carry the baby around, how do I do that? And a lot of folks who are getting into that space are sort of see the view of, hey, a, a small SUV, a midsize SUV really starts to do it. So our job is how do we build an architecture that really starts to address that and really address the, that fundamental range, right? 300 miles in, in all of our clinics is sort of this almost magic number. It shouldn't be a magic number, to be frank, but most of us feel much more comfortable in that space. If anybody's driven a Bolt EV, I have one. It's 238 miles. Now the model year 2020 commercial time is 259 miles. You can live with it. You can live with it easy. You can live with it so easily you might not charge every day. That's how much you can live with it. And so now getting people exposed to that and comfortable with that level of range and being able to live with it as part of that education and outreach. So that thing, it's really do batteries matter and to boil down a little bit of the, the sort of decrease in, in battery costs that Elaine was showing. Um, this gives you a better picture of how does this fit into the grand scheme of, of how do you build a vehicle platform, right? And you can say, see in, into the very foreseeable future, the battery dominate, dominates the cost of, of the vehicle. So figuring out the, the, the chemistry, <laughs> the, the how to build it, how to do all of those things is, is really an important piece. I, I would argue GM, again, another commercial, you know, we, we have the, one of the countries and world's largest battery labs have had it from day one. We really believe the importance of getting that battery right and making sure it's robust, it lasts as long as it needs to for an automotive application, which you're talking about a couple hundreds of thousands of miles, and it does it in a robust sense, it is a good one. And it does it at the right cost. Now, a little bit more dear to my heart, um, is, is really how do you build the infrastructure? And I think what's neat about this is this lays over now the cityscape, right? And how do you start to figure out how do we build the right charging networks to satisfy folks across the board, right? First and foremost, single family homes, you got a car, you got a garage, you can bring it home, you charge it. It's sort of an easy solution set, right? So most people usually charge at home, they enjoy charging home, it's easy for them to charge at home. Um, but what about those people that don't live at home? How do we start to th solve those problems? The next really neat solution set here is around workplace charging. Not only does it help adoption with EVs, uh, because what happens is you see a colleague who has an EV, you talk to them, you're not talking to GM or dealership and somebody's trying to sell you something, you're actually talking to somebody you trust and you actually see it. If you don't have charging at home, for example, you live in an apartment in downtown Detroit, you start to bolster your ability to have charging in those locations. 
Um, what's also neat and not really talked about, and Sarah and I are always knocking heads uh, as we start to think about these, is for example, when you have renewable energy, you can, when does re renewable energy come? It usually comes during the day. So it's sort of a new, I'm not gonna call it a peak in Michigan, but in California, there's a lot of renewable curtailment. So when that vehicle's parked at work, it can take advantage of those renewables, for example. And same thing with a public network. And so, you know, really building a robust public network for people to feel comfortable, and for those who don't have charging at home in that single family home, how do they start to take advantage of it? Other neat things, right? That network can help power rideshare vehicles and electrify those and have a really robust mileage uh, target associated with it. So some of the things that my team uh, is really thinking about is how do you solve those things, right? How do you make charging at home easier with Qmerit? Uh, you can take your cell phone now, click a couple of pictures, do a survey. Within a few days, you have three electricians who are bidding over you. You can start to think about um, virtual charge networks. How do you solve the interoperability issue, right? Where GM now can be an aggregator of this information to help every person who buys an EV get an account at every single station out there. Um, workplace charging, we, we've been a long time leader in this space to, for our own employees. Um, we need to do more and I expect that we will do more uh, in the coming months to really think about how to solve that and then use that as a model for other companies to say this is how we should electrify. Both as a benefit to their employees, uh, retention and other things, but also to talk about how does the, um, your sort of energy, your facility energy management fit into that space. And then one of the other very big things that we're working on right now, we announced uh, a few week, months ago, um, our work to work with Bechtel. So Bechtel is the largest construction company in, in the country. Uh, what they're really good at is seeing big, right? And so these guys did the big dig. They, they're putting that cap over Chernobyl, right? They put a bunch of the cell phone towers out there. They, they are looking at this as a very simple infrastructure problem. And they said, well, we have people and investment cycles that do that. Why don't we sort of put our our ability to go do at a very high level scale. General Motors sort of data and know how to backstop uh, the, the right places to put these stations. We'll bring in an operator and we'll put all those pieces together sort of as an investable entity because that's what we always do. That's how we did cell phone towers. That's how we did these things. So we're actively in the middle of that. So that's a sort of a real time view of how uh, our team is thinking about those different things. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, I imagine, on the panel, but how to put those pieces together I think is a, a really fun part of, of, of putting this new sort of world order associated with electric vehicles into practice in our city. So thank you very much and looking forward to the conversation. Um, is a, was the sort of first mobility innovation office in the America, it was this mayor's idea, and basically gave me sort of two directions when I started. One was uh, think differently, and the second was get stuff done. Emphasis on sort of the second part with maybe a little bit different language as well. Um, but you know what, what we're focused, we're a really small group in a, in a large city, in a large city government <clears throat> that's essentially saying, how do we make it easier for, for folks in the city to get around? And using new types of uh, mobility services or technologies that don't exist today, but also doing it in partnership with our residents. So <clears throat> we essentially have a, a three-phase approach, um, where one is, really understanding the challenges that folks are facing. Um, transportation and mobility is a really personal experience and it is hard to understand the challenges that other people have without actually talking to them. Um, you know, the lived experience is the best way to really understand it, but learned is as best we can do. Um, I'm never gonna know what it's like to be a female riding the bus in Detroit. It's just not something I can, I can physically do. Um, but, you know, we need to be able to understand all of these different perspectives and the frictions they have in our current transportation system, but also how they view some of these new modes of, of transportation. Um, you know, we've launched a lot over the last few years, and whether it's, we went through the list earlier, but, um, you know, with this partnership with Lyft, you know, we've understood, like, you know, how people view 
Um, sometimes transit and taking a Lyft or an Uber is a binary decision and not simply saying like, I'm gonna take the bus and then a Lyft. So lots of education on our part. You know, with scooters, we've, we've not just learned sort of the, the challenges of, in a more our denser areas, but there are a lot of use cases that exist in the neighborhoods for, for people to be able to use them. Um, <clears throat> so you, we have to sort of build a lot of relationships, but then also, um, get stuff done. Um, and we've done that in a number of ways. We've had lessons learned. Um, you know, we've built things internally on our own. Um, we've had partnerships. One of our successful ones is, was when Alex was at Maven, um, was expanding car share, um, both through um, a pilot agreement um, for on street, but also in partnership with the community center on the east side to get workforce trips. And that's what we've seen we, we do actually really well is, is helping really facilitate those things where the onus isn't completely on us, but we can help move it quicker. Um, and then the other challenge is like, how do we scale this? Um, and I think that's a lot of the topic here um, is, you know, it's, it's fine to get a pilot up and running, but to, to build a, a full citywide service, like there has to be some sort of business model around it. Um, part of that business model is us as a city paying for it. Um, but there are other opportunities and, and whether it's um, returning, um, being able to, to understand that, you know, leakages that are happening from different businesses and, and how transportation fits into it, it, it's a really important part of it. Um, now, depending on the day, like if you ask me about electric vehicles, I might tell you I don't care. Um, and it's mainly just due to, you know, we have an acute problem in Detroit with folks struggling to get where they need to go. Um, and, you know, I am not going to, like, hold a solution back because the solution is not electric, right? Yes, in my heart, like, I say, like, I, I wish like we could be deploying electric all across the city, but that's not the situation. And like to, to tell someone uh, who's, who just needs to get to an interview in the suburbs and say like, well, our electric vehicle supply is not, that's not, not a real thing. Like we need to be able to get people where they need to go. But at the same time, like we need to start building the strategies on saying like, how do we begin to um, begin to incorporate electric vehicles into our solutions and how we do business. Um, but also because it's, it's such a critical part, both of GM and Ford and Waymo as well, three companies that have invested in the city, um, you know, we need to be working with them um, along with uh, DTE, who ours, who's our electric provider, to start to figure this out. So um, in addition to my office, which is fairly new, we also have a sustainability office, which is fairly new. Um, and they recently re uh, released uh, an action agenda, um, which had two things that are focusing on where we're looking at electric vehicles. Um, one is essentially like we have a pretty large fleet. Um, and one of the things I've learned working in the city is that uh, people love buying big vehicles. Uh, so we, we buy a lot of SUVs for, uh, and you know, it's, it's a huge emission number of just people just driving around. So, you know, we've, we've installed our first vehicle, electric vehicle chargers. We're starting to put this into our process of saying, how do we start to, to address that piece? Um, and then the second piece is, you know, the electric vehicle infrastructure strategy. Um, I was talking um, with Sarah a little earlier. When I first started this job, I, I met with our counterpart at DTE, and we we're both just like, well, we probably should start figuring this out. Because um, there's not an obvious blueprint, right? Like, there's nobody who says, like, that's the best case, like, everybody start doing that. Because this is, this is new for everybody, though. Alex will yell at me when I say, say that. Um, but it's, like, you can build a, like, if you want to build a bike lane, there's 95 million examples of that across the United States at this point. It says, like, here's the exact say. But there's not a simple say of, like, how do we build an infrastructure, an EV strategy in a city, let alone a region, right, that has all sorts of different needs. So we are beginning that. Um, that said, we have launched, a, a, what I'd say, a fairly innovative pilot um, where we did an ideation session. GM was part of it. DTE was part of it. The state was part of it. Um, and you know the awareness, the awareness piece came up, the fast charging piece came up, and we said like let's let's try something out. So this is in Beacon Park near D DTE's headquarters, where we have four fast chargers, um, where essentially you can put your vehicle there and get it charged in 20 to 30 minutes and, and be on your way. And our hypothesis is that if we put these in places where people would want to be they will, might start to attract people. So this is across the street from Beacon Park, across from Lumen Restaurant. You can hang out there for 20 to 30 minutes. The next deployment will be in Capitol Park. It's a great park. There's lots of great eating and coffee establishments. So, you know, just sort of quick things in and out. Like it's not as convenient as a gas station where you're just pulling in for a couple of minutes, 
but like you have stuff to do. And if this works, you know, we can start to say like, how do we start to then tie this into other economic development strategies we have across the city where we're building um, streetscapes and investing in neighborhoods and investing in local retail to say, this is where we're having it. We want you to come here, charge your vehicle, and then spend a little bit money and discover the neighborhood as well. So we're trying this out. I have no idea it's going to work, but at least it's sort of, you know, you're talking it out loud. It's like, ah, oh, it kind of makes sense. So, you know, this is where we're, we're really starting, particularly on the, on the fast charging strategy. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Sarah. Um, so I thought, just, I thought I'd start just by explaining why I care about this topic, both personally and then on a planet level. So personally, uh, from 2006 to 2011, I served as an active duty officer in the U.S. Army. And I saw firsthand just how utterly reliant our military is on fuel to get places. Up to, at one point, up to 40% of the convoys in Iraq were fuel runs. So basically, moving fuel from one place to another in these big tankers, big targets. So for me personally, this is a motivator to figure out how to do this right. On a planet level, something interesting happened in 2017. If you look at the emissions that the utility industry across the nation was emitting, uh, that, that, that line started to go down a little bit. At the same time, the transportation industry, that line was still maintaining. So in 2017, what happened is that transportation emissions actually um, overtook utility emissions. So that's interesting for two reasons. First of all, when you think about that transportation line, that's a really big target to hit in terms of how are we going to how are we going to bring down those emissions as a nation? Transportation sector is a big place to focus. If you look at that utility line, you see that increasingly more and more, the electricity that you're going to be using to fuel these cars is also uh, clean. And it's getting cleaner and cleaner as more coal plants shut down. So it's a really exciting time, I think, to be working on this. So what is the utility role? Uh, so if you can see this in the back, it's a picture from the 1880s in New York City. And across the top, there's a lot of uh, what are wires, basically. So this is what happened when the electric grid started going up uh, around the nation. And what we think about now is this is kind of the equivalent period for uh, our infrastructure for electric vehicles. And as Alex was starting to talk about, how do we do this in a right way so that we don't end up with something like this? So that's what I just said here. Um, so for us as a utility, there's a danger of overcommitting too early because we take our uh, responsibility very seriously in terms of what do we do with the customer dollars and to deploy those in the right way. But we know we have to do something. So one of the things that we can help with as a utility is to help figure out where stuff goes because we know where the grid is, where there's areas of excess and where there's areas of um, no capacity. And so help working with site hosts to figure out where to put chargers is an important thing that can save a lot of money both for uh, the site host as well as uh, everyone on that grid because you can avoid uh, taxing systems that are already uh, um, overzealous. And that's what I'm getting at a little bit here. So depending on how we deploy EVs, they could burden or benefit the grid. So the uh, on either side, the left side is the burden, the right side is the benefit. So the blue uh, load peak there is we just modeled like a simple household use. So you can see around like 6 o'clock at night is usually when energy peaks and then it kind of goes down as you go to sleep. So what we said is what if two cars come home at 6 o'clock and plug in at the same time? You can see where that green part goes and shoots up beyond the capacity of the grid. So in that case, we would have to go in and add a transformer or add a substation, and that's extra cost onto the system. However, um, you can avoid that and not only avoid it, but increase the benefits by uh, managing the charging. So instead of coming home at 6 o'clock and plugging straight in, you could come in and program your car to go on at a later time. So in this model, we said one car starts at 10 o'clock at night, the next one starts at 2 o'clock. And then you can see what's happening here is not only are we avoiding the peak, so we're not going to have to install more infrastructure, but actually we're filling the trough, which has this um, additional benefit of increasing the revenue to the system without having to increase the investment, which means over time that the costs for everyone using the system are going to go down which is a really powerful benefit. So in terms of when, it, when we talk about managed charging, there's a couple things to consider. So when is a big part of this? When should people charge? So we just talked about this one. Try to think about filling the troughs and avoiding the peaks. In terms of where, we talked about this one as well. So some parts of the grid are used more than others. So figuring out how to put infrastructure in a way, maybe it's only a difference of one mile or two, can make a really big difference in terms of the cost. 
And finally, how much are you charging? So um, we heard a little bit from Alex about the different types of chargers, but there's basic charging at home, level one charging it's called, so that's when you're just gonna plug literally into one of these outlets here. It's gonna take a really long time, but you can do it. Uh, the next level up is level two, so this is what you see most of the time around town, um, or if you're at like a Meyer, um, you'll see a level two charger. But this is also what people can have in their houses, um, and it makes the charging a lot faster. And then finally, uh, the DC fast charging. And um, these are starting to be deployed. Uh, um, we just saw some pictures from Mark on the ones that are getting deployed in Detroit. So uh, there's a lot of con consumer benefits across these and figuring out where and when they should go. But from the grid perspective as well, you can imagine those DC fast chargers are gonna have a different impact on the grid than the basic charging. So again, it's another layer of how do we do this in the, in the best way. Uh, so just wanted to end with, um, there are some active utility programs today in Michigan. So I've got uh, Consumers Energy on the left with our Power My Drive program, and on the right is DTE's Charging Forward program. So um, these are things that uh, you can go check out today if you're interested. So thank you. So great presentation. Thank you so much. So I did a... A conversation like this bringing together various stakeholders in New York a few years ago and we had various parts of the city we had the public utility we had automakers represented but that was a closed-door session so I think it's really cool that here in Detroit we're doing it in a public way and making you part of the conversation now these are very complicated issues, but let's try to winnow it down for a second and get different perspectives. So if you could only choose one obstacle that is the obstacle that concerns you most to EV adoption, what would you pick? Sarah. Start with me. I think it's a testament to where the market's going that for me right now, it's all about the infrastructure. So it used to be a chicken the egg. Is it the car? Is it the charger? I think the cars are coming, as you showed. So for me, it's about getting the infrastructure in the right places. Great, thank you. All right, as, as someone who um, knows nothing about cars and hates the car buying experience, like <laughs> just, it's so overwhelming. Like the, all the stuff that you have to know and learn mm -hmm. Uh, for I'm, I'm sure like a second time EV car buyer is much more confident than a first time uh, car buyer because it's just like from like doing math when you're buying the vehicle to like just figuring out the charging and, and all that stuff like it's just it's a lot of lot of work right and just making that that process much easier to understand from a consumer side I feel like would benefit me but I think a lot of folks to, to, from the education and awareness side okay so consumer education simplifying buying an EV I'm going to say two, but what is existential gas prices? Mm. That's the chief economist in me. I, I think if you change, if ch gas prices went up, things would be completely different, dramatically. Um, now, I can't do that. Um, I, I think it is probably education and outreach. I think there's a lot of information that people are still uh, just blatantly unaware of about EVs, right? There's these mysteries, they're golf carts, they're slow. Uh, how do you charge? It's harder to do it. I'm gonna have to change my life. Yeah, you are gonna have to change your life. You know what you're gonna do? You're never gonna go to a gas station again. You're gonna go home, right? And as my wife says, I don't have to be in heels, in the snow, waiting for 15 minutes for this car to fill up. And, you know, when, when we do things, GM, for example, and other automakers in the industry, we don't sell those messages. We say it takes 10 hours to charge. It takes five hours to charge. The reality is it takes 10 seconds to get your butt out of the chair, plug it in, walk in your house and forget about it, and not have to be in your heels in the snow at a gas station. And so I think we gotta do a much better job on the consumer and education, consumer education outreach. So I'll add, so again, like I don't know anything about cars, so like when I saw the diagram when we were doing this project of like where each model has their charging point and like the different like nozzles that you put into it, it was utterly confusing, right? Like it's just like 48 permutations of different things where it's like, you know, my car right now, it's like I look at the arrow and it's this side or that side, I put the gas on, right? And it's just like these things where it's like everybody's been trying to do their own thing and not say like work together to like move this as an industry. You know how to plug in a USB cord? Yeah, because there's and one You know USB how to plug cord. in a fire wire? I'm just saying, I'm just you've saying, made it difficult. Yeah. No, but I, we made it difficult, but we also haven't simplified the message. Yeah. 
And, and I think automakers traditionally have been good at simplifying messages around what our stuff does well. And, you know, again, I'm not saying we've dropped the ball completely. The market's got to be ready. The people need to be receptive to hear some of those things. But I, I think education, are, not to diminish <laughs> infrastructure. Um, and frankly speaking, I'll take over, sorry, this is a recipe. Like, to get this right, and I don't, I mean, I know you want to simplify it, but really to get a good soup, you need a whole bunch of ingredients. And I think right, the states start. that are doing well, you need all of those ingredients. You need infrastructure, you need range, you need the vehicle, you need some incentives. Usually those incentives need to talk to the person writing the check at the home versus the person who's not writing the check at the home. So you gotta have some non-financial incentives. You know, California, the beauty of California was traffic sucks so bad that you couldn't buy time. But you could buy time with an EV when you got yourself into a carpool lane. Right? So we have to find ways of putting all of those ingredients that work for Michigan into a pot, stir them up, and spit out what is a good soup. Okay, so you started, you, you narrowed the lens as I asked, <laughs> and then you started widening it out. So Mark, what do you see as the key challenges and opportunities in moving to, toward an electrified mobility problem, platform? Sure. So, I mean, in Detroit, it's just cost, right? Like, um, you know, I'm sure everybody here is aware of how much you pay for car insurance, and it's much worse in Detroit. Um, and when you've got, you know, people making $28,000, $30,000 gross, and, um, you know, they're getting charged $6,000 a year on car insurance, to ask them to pay another premium when they buy a car, like, it's just, like, it's just not, not a thing. And... You know, I, I, so I mean, that's the biggest thing, and, I, and that's not, you know, there's two sides of that equation, right? Like there's the, the EV side, but then there's also sort of the, the cost of owning a vehicle here in the state that needs to, to come down significantly. But that's, that's the biggest barrier in Detroit right now is just the, the value proposition of saying, like, we want you to, even though it will, if you sort of have the car that, that long, it will sort of work itself out, but on the, the initial capital side, it's just not, doable right now. Okay, so let me, well, let's take this a little further. Now, I mean, first of all, as long as there is a cost premium, you know, EVs aren't for everyone, and indeed that 28,000 income person when they're buying a vehicle is probably buying a used vehicle, right? The vehicles actually, on average, are about 12 years old and change hands four times, so that those vehicles will serve multiple people. But recognizing that you have multiple priorities that you're trying to balance, in terms of moving forward effectively, what stakeholders should we bring, be bring to the table? How do you see um, advancing the EV discussion? So, and I think it's a good one for Sarah as well. I mean, for us, it's like, we have a lot of vehicles, we have a lot of land, right? So it gives us an opportunity to say like, how, how can we be a catalyst for something like this? And not just for our fleet, but then for Maven or for Lyft or Uber, to basically say like, if we can sort of start creating this infrastructure, Figuring out like how we can we can share it um, could hopefully sort of start things going um, because I, I think if we if if we as the city don't sort of take the the lead on sort of trying these things out it's going to be a tough tough value proposition. So Sarah, you picked elect the infrastructure as your number one challenge. So talk to me about what you see some of the challenges in getting the infrastructure in place and how that relates to urban planning. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple things. I think the first big one is uh, who's gonna pay for it? Uh, because they aren't cheap, and um, at least right now, they're not um, as economical as a gas station would be. So uh, you're not getting enough utilization, at least at the public chargers, to be able to recoup the investment up front. So we're seeing a couple solutions for that. Um, one big one that's going around the country is uh, the funding from the VW uh, settlement. So VW got busted for the diesel um, uh, controversy, and so as a result, they uh, are doing two things. One is they are starting a program called Electrify America, where they're putting chargers across the country. The second one is that um, they're giving money to every state to figure out how to mitigate diesel. So in Michigan, for example, with the first tranche of funding, uh, Michigan's decided to spend it largely on um, school buses and putting uh, DC fast chargers in. So just some examples of how we're starting to solve the cost part of it. 
Um, I think the other part of it is just the technology uncertainty. So um, what kind of charger should I put in? How fast are these things going to get? If I'm putting one in today, is it going to be outdated in three years? You know, I don't want to like no. install a payphone. But what is that? No. <laughs> but I think that is that is part of the concern. Is you know, do I do it now or should I wait? So I think that's part of it too. Um, but it's it's that first big one about who's supposed to do this and how. So can I just jump? I'm just give you my experience on the the fast charging. So. When we did the project originally, we got some beautiful renderings on sort of the, the fast charging stations and everybody sort of having a great time, blending in with the park seamlessly. It looked great, right? And then when we get our engineering drawings for the Capitol Park one, which was just two, two DC fast charging, there all of a sudden was now a 10 foot high by like 14 foot wide transformer sitting in the middle of the park. <laughs> and I was like, well. <laughs> We're not putting that in the middle of one of our parks, everyone. So let's go back to the, so it's just, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it, it seems great, but then all of a sudden it's like you've got to figure out how to get power to a park that doesn't have power and putting it in. And now you're, and it's just like, well, that's not, we can't scale that, right? Like if that's the solution, we're not going to be sticking these gigantic transformers up in the ground everywhere across the city. Yeah, so there's definitely something about taking advantage where power is and also learning about the aesthetics. But Alex, I know you want to jump in on this question. So the good news with Michigan is I think we're learning from other parts of the country. So, you know, for example, th this notion of utilization, right? The, the, the downside of utilization is when it's low, right, it's not economical. The good news is most of the estimates put utilization around 15 to 20 percent where it starts to become economical. So you're, you're talking four to six hours a day, you're talking four to six chargers on a 50 kilowatt charger. So if you can drive that, then you actually have another problem, which is you're actually competing and queuing and you're figuring out those things. So for example, where we were building onesies and twosies in California, those stations at Whole Foods and other places now are loaded so much that the customer experience sucks. Like people show up and they can't get a charge and they disappear, it, which you know again is not a great story. And so, for to translate that into Michigan is when we go build them, we're going to probably build hubs now, right? Which means fewer sites to go do this, but more stations in those sites to avoid that. And so you're you're, you're spreading the economics of building a new transformer that you can't see um, you know, across more stations and those sorts of things. So, and likewise on the utility programs, right? There, there's been a lot of public discourse within the, their regulatory schemes of how do you go do this. And, and our position has always been, there is no one single blueprint and that blueprint really needs to work with what that utility is trying to do as well as the region in which they're operating in. And, and consumers and, and DT have two very good steps in the right direction to sort of, I'm speaking on your behalf, I mean, to, to get into, into this mix. And a lot of that was because we had those conversations with regulators to say, hey, some of this should be rate-based, right? Some of this actually, to, to Sarah's point, is charging in that trough. And in charging in that trough, it creates benefits that otherwise wouldn't be there. So how do we put all of these industries together, including the city, and think about more chargers, charging when you want them to charge, right? And started put the building blocks and the technology to enable that. So I, I, it is hard and I call EVs my million one dollar problems. And it's, but it's also not something that's insurmountable. This is, we can build these databases. And I think it's just, let's go blunt force the stuff thoughtfully, um, thoughtfully blunt force. I don't know if that works, but I'll go with it do that in such a way where you can sort of actively build the network in such a way that it's successful and get yourself to Traverse City and get yourself to Jackson and do all these things that are necessary so the customer's confident that this network is, is, works for them. So Mark, we're not alone as an automaker in being motivated about this issue. It's a really important issue for the industry. What's your advice to automakers in interacting with cities? Yeah, uh, be ready to learn, right? Because I mean, I, I think uh, I mean Alex will tell you that uh, you know the work, the project we did. I think Alex learned a lot about uh, the both sort of the the resident focus, but also the challenges of just sort of government and doing new things in government, which is not easy, which is why people have not done them. And it's just sort of a cycle that continues. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think it's also under you know for us, you know, as a city, like 
electric vehicles, electrification is new as well. Like I don't know the utility space. I don't know the the sort of car share space and sort of understanding the 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 need for transactions and what needs to happen there. Um, so it's it's everybody having to do things a little bit differently, um, and being able to sort of everybody sit down to to think through this issue, um, and be able to sometimes like take off the the hat you're wearing and just kind of focus on the goal and outcome that you're looking to do, because um, otherwise you're just going to sort of get siloed. But I think this is sort of a thing that's that needs to need unique partnerships between public, private, and utility to actually make this all work. Yeah, I'll just add. I think Mark has certainly helped me learn, but he, he's not solving for transportation or mobility. He's solving for access. He's solving for that person to get to work. He's solving for that person to get to their doctor's appointment. And so if I'm solving his transportation problem, I got to help him think about those things. And I think that, that, that I've come a long way within my time at Maven to sort of respect that, right? It's, I can't bring in something that is just gonna serve my needs and not his. It, it really, and I say his as the residents that he serves in, in this space. So Sarah, I loved your opening remarks about why electrifying transportation is personal for you and important to our environment. So let's turn to the environmental side of this question. Mayor Duggan and 18 other Michigan mayors have said that they will work to uphold the Paris Accord. What can, what role can EVs play in helping cities, states, and even countries achieve those in other environmental goals? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I pre-answered it a little bit already. Um, but to add to that, the other piece that is really compelling in cities is air emissions. So uh, you're in a much more condensed environment. You've got a lot of traffic, a lot of cars, buses, that type of thing. And so I think that's another big opportunity, particularly in cities, uh, to that where electric vehicles can help a lot is with that localized air emissions. Um, as well as that, it's just the, the bigger benefits of um, having less emissions from your, your fleet. So like cities have large fleets, um, and then there's a lot of people that are coming in as well. There's a lot of ride sharing happening. And so uh, I think the other interesting thing there is that there's, people aren't usually driving very far. So there's shorter ranges. So that's a, a bonus in terms of getting uh, electric vehicles going. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, particularly in cities. So I'm going to jump in. Uh, so EV really focuses on sort of the supply side of emissions within transportation. Um, the demand side cannot be ignored as well, right? And you know, while sort of making vehicles uh, more environmentally friendly is great, like not driving at all mm. is a much better solution for that. Um, so getting people in this, this city and region to take more transit, uh, creating more walkable communities so people will walk, biking, carpooling, th these types of solutions are also really vital to sort of achieving this goal of like the planet not disappearing, um, which is hard, right? It's really hard in the city and it's really hard in this region um, to sort of, sort of think about that, but it's necessary, right? And it's not, it's not super hard, like, I'm, I'm now getting on soapbox, but like, you know, get, getting on your first transit trip, like it's, it's a big barrier, but once you get on the first one, like you're like, all right, this is not that hard. And you start to figure out like how you can begin to do these things. And, you, and like, we're trying to figure out like even, we have a grant, we just want a grant from um, DOT to sort of do our first electric buses, both DDOT and Smart. So we're gonna be sort of electrifying that, but um, to sort of just like hope that electric vehicles are going to save us from transportation emissions is not a real, answer. There's Agreed. a city in uh, Washington state that's experimenting with electric fer ferries, yeah. water ferries. So that could be an option too for Detroit. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I'm with Mark again. I, I think he's helped me learn a lot of things, right? The, the backbone of any urban landscape has got to be transit. And actually probably right after it's walking, right? Most of us experience and live and love our city by walking through it. So um, that being said, when, when we do have transportation options, th those need to be electrified, whether they're shared use fleets. And we've done that with Maven. The nice thing about those shared use fleets is they put a ton of miles on. They use a lot of electrons. So they actually drive the utilization of public DC fast charging, right, where you can start to create 
um, some sort of relatively cyclical benefits within the system. And so um, totally with Mark, he's, he's trained me well that we, we need those trans, uh, transit backbones to really make sure that, that we do the right thing. But at the same time, there, not every ride is going to be on a bus <laughs> or a ferry. Um, and, and we got to figure out how to electrify them and put the infrastructure in place to, to, to meet those needs. I mean, if you look at, like, probably the biggest disruption we've had in emissions in the last five years were scooters, because scooters started to eat into Uber and Lyft trips, right? And has reduced the demand of, of that, that mode. And so, you know, I think it's, you know, you've got the minds at GM thinking through all these other different ways to sort of build different types of modes of travel, and it's just, you know, it's a really, really complex, uh, and you sort of add freight and all, so it gets, it gets really heavy, but um, the, the demand side is, is needs to really be focused on as well, and that's also what we do a lot on. So before I open it to questions from you, our audience, giving you a couple minute warning to be ready. I want to touch on equity. How do we make sure that in doing this, it's not just the wealthy who benefit from EVs? Yeah, so I mean, that's basically like our, our centering um, uh, goal is, you know, when we create these solutions and make sure that they work for all Detroiters. Um, you know, and for us, I think that's why we're, do we're doing this pilot, but, you know, we need to figure out like how we can, you know, expand these options across the city. Um, and you know that's where we start to think through of like, <clears throat> all right, we have some place like Northwest Activity Center where we have a lot of city operations. We have it's sort of the hub of activity in the community. To say like, if we were to sort of start doing some charging stations there, that would work for us. They would work for Maven. Then we could maybe potentially open them up for folks at night to sort of use as free parking spaces in the neighborhood. So we've got to be creative, right? Like this is you know, that's a lot of what our role is to do is to sort of you know, private sector is going to come in, and then we have to say you know, how can we push to sort of make sure that this works for everyone. Uh, a couple of things. New EVs generate used EVs. You made an allusion to that. And used EVs can then get adopted. The nice thing is you come down the depreciation curve when it's new. And, and so you can allow the wealthy to sort of pay for that curve, if you will. It's, again, uh, chief economist in me. Um, the, I'm, oh, aspiring. I'm aspiring. Um, <laughs> the, the other side is, is, again, to think sort of about some of these programs. So when I was at Maven, we started putting EVs into the ride hailing fleets. And so what in that case is somebody doesn't have a car to, to participate in Uber and Lyft and other sort of gig economy type roles. We rent them the vehicle, we include insurance, we include maintenance on the car. So in a, a vehicle that they otherwise couldn't afford, they actually got into and used and took advantage of the benefit of the total cost of operation, right? And we sort of priced that into the model. So the good news was we put, you know, roughly 10 people in a year who were driving those cars for those services. They rented it from us anywhere from, you know, uh, four to, to eight weeks. They wouldn't otherwise have access to them, which is neat. And they were taking those cars into the community. The other side of it is the people who are sitting in the back seat of their car who would otherwise wouldn't be in the back seat of that car as well. So I think we need to think about these novel programs where we're putting, making EVs sort of accessible in a new way, in a different way to, to the same folks. A, a really easy way of electrifying for, for the masses is mass transit, right? And, and that experience becomes better for them. They're not listening to a diesel bus or smelling diesel bus. They're, they're actually in a much quieter, more enjoyable ride overall. So electrifying a lot of these things within the normal scope, I think, will, will create benefits for, for a lot of different folks. Yeah, I think mass transit's going to be a big one there. And then going back to, again, with the grid. So we've got, we've built the capacity up to a certain level. So insofar as we can use more of that existing capacity without needing to build more transformers substations, it's going to lower the cost for everyone using the grid. So I think that's a, a really big opportunity that affects everyone, whether or not you have an EV or you're riding an electric bus, if you're using the electricity, it's going to be a benefit. Great, thank you. Well, it's ter our turn to ask you questions. Now, do we have a roving mic or do we have to people? And so we have a roving mic. We have a first question right down there. Um, but if you can stand up and project, you can start talking before the mic comes. All right, you're talking a lot. Oh, Sarah, yeah, good job. this question's towards you. Um, I happen to own a uh, commercial building in downtown Pontiac, and I noticed that they're doing serious and significant upgrades to the electrical grid, putting in new substations and things of that nature. I find it fascinating that um, we own a, a Cadillac electric vehicle, some Chevy Volts, we have charging stations in our parking lot. 
but nobody from the community has asked us what is our long-term plans for our 200 car parking lot about what electrification is going to be. And you mentioned something really interesting about power substations. Mm -hmm. um, I have no plans to put a substation on my parking lot, but they're changing the grid right now. Who should I talk to about uh, planning five to 10 years out for what the electrical needs in my parking lot? Yeah, great question. So for tonight, you can talk to me after this. <laughs> um, but for the utility, um, it's our it's our intake with our engineers who are doing the, the grid planning. And they're the ones when you are, say you were installing a new building or retrofitting it up um, to figure out those new service connections. That's who you would be talking to about that. But I think you raise an interesting point, which I think is one of the challenges that Mark was getting at, which is, um, there's these new connections between all of these groups that we're not used to dealing with. So automakers weren't used to dealing with utilities. <laughs> um, cities aren't used to thinking about either. Well, I guess we're used to yelling at utilities for like, why are they still in the road? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's so they're getting used to working utilities. with us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and for our part as a utility, we've got great relationships with um, the energy managers or the business owners or the business. Um, like the, the management company, but talking to people who are thinking about fleets or facilities, that's very new. So there's, there's all these inroads that we're still trying to make. So thank you for bringing that up. And I think there's a lot of guidance is starting to come out. We need to do better at it about sort of what 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 is a reasonable sort of electrifying a parking lot and what is the usage of that parking lot? Is it is it 5% of spots? Is it 10 spots? Is it 12% of spots? And so I, I think the industry still sort of Figuring that out. If it's workplace, maybe maybe it's a little bit more. If it's if it's more of a public lot, so uh, we got to get better at some of that guidance. Generally speaking, and I, I would say there's probably not a lot of advice out there. There's a lot of information once you find it, but how do you translate that you know that information into like this is what we should go do? Is is still needs to come together. Okay, great. We have our next question over here, and if you're ready to ask a question, put your hands up, and a mic will come over to you. Uh, great, great panel. Uh, great discussion. My name is Manoj Bakarwa from EV Box. Uh, I had a question about if everyone could look ahead 20 years from now, what does the car buying experience or purchase experience become? Do, do utilities own the cars? Do cities provide them as a service? Or do automakers provide uh, subscriptions? I'd mean, love to get your mm -hmm. thoughts. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a cop out, right? But uh, I mean, I think this is an industry that's in such transition. like. And you know, no one knows when like we'll have electrification figured out, right? No one has any idea when autonomous vehicles will be ready, let alone like what a business model. I mean, GM might have an idea of what they think it is, but like they're not going to say for certainty of what it is. So I mean, it's it's a hard thing to figure out, right? And then it's and then kind of goes back to sort of what I wanted to be in the beginning is just like car buying experience right now is probably like I find it annoying, right? But it's rely. I know what it is. Like I know the process I have to do and the anxiety of dealing with a dealer and everything. But you start to sort of think about like all these new variables and how do you, how do you train an entire like 16 year olds to 80 year olds on sort of this whole, whole new thing. And I, and I think the electrification sort of is just probably the first piece of the, this whole change of, of how, how we deal with this part of society. Uh, a case in point, electric scooters didn't exist 18 months ago, right? You know, like Uber really didn't exist five years ago. And, and I mean, they were, but so I think the space is evolving. If I had one prediction that I would have to bank my life on is you're going to have a much more integrated experience. I think we're much more comfortable trying different things, generally speaking than we ever have, or at least my parents were, which was always a car. I think a lot of us, including Uber, really got of, out of the mentality of like, it's our car every ride, every time. Now we gotta start bleeding that into, all right, when should you take the bus? How do you make it seamless? Yeah. I, I think that's my one, I, I think, prediction that I'd bet my life on, that, that it's gonna be a more integrated experience. I think related to that, um, this whole trend of subscription services and tailoring custom solutions, I think, can be really interesting. You're already starting to see some OEMs who are experimenting with like subscription services to car ownership. So, I think that might be something that is going to be tinkered with for a while. But 
um, one of the things I always think about with this is that people don't like to do something wholeheartedly because when you think about it, there are still people who use horses <laughs> to get around. So 30 years from now, I think there'll still be quite a mix of things going on. Okay, so if you have a question, put your hand up and keep it up. There's two mics and they'll each go to one person. Hi. So I had a follow-on question to Dave's question up front. So we went to undergrad at the same time, so maybe we share some of the same brain. But, uh, and that's an inside joke. As construction is going on around town, I was listening to um, Chad Livengood on Stephen Henderson's show earlier this week, and they were talking about internet deserts and how the opportunity to put infrastructure for high-speed internet is being lost along, for example, Avenue of Fashion and when the queue line went in, are we building in the capacity to have better electricity infrastructure when we're tearing up different road projects so that we don't have to go back through five years later and tear all that concrete up again to put in the wires? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so this, this is not the area where I work, so I can't give any meaningful, um, any meaningful examples. But I do know that, again, it's just, we're, st we're still looking at this kind of integrated way of um, how do we think about electrification opportunities and working with cities in a new way and working with companies and all that. So I think from my perspective, it is something that we're looking at and trying to get out ahead of. It's interesting because the utility planning cycle is years in advance. And so one of the challenges is matching that up with these much more near-term opportunities and being ready to say, oh, like maybe there's an electrification opportunity here in this thing that's been planned for five years. So I think that the timing is a little tricky, but I think we're catching up to it. it, it maybe not a complete answer either, but you know, utilities have dealt with low growth for 100 years. And they've managed the, the introduction of air conditioners and a lot of these things. And so it, generally, to your point, maybe there's some inefficiencies built into the system, but we, we've also sort of gotten there. The other side of it is energy efficiency programs are a huge part of our sort of grid overall and driving down the usage of the existing system as we drive up. Um, the EVs is a key part. And then the other part is the EVs themselves can actually be a grid resource, right? You, you can use managed charging and some of these other more sophisticated programs, vehicle to grid and other things where now the vehicle itself can become sort of an asset in those places, particularly frequency regulation and other things. Again, I might talk gibberish for some folks, but that's at like the end of the line. You need some help to, to manage that. The EV then can play a role in some of those spaces. So it, 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 it's, I think it's something that we can manage. There'll probably be some inefficiencies, but at least the conversation we've had is most utilities seem well prepared for it. So let's take our next question right up there. Hi, um, I'm Alexa. So I just want to say uh, thank you for your service, because I have um, family thank who's you. also in the military, so thank you. Um, my question is about the weather and the uh, car battery technology, because, I mean, we, love, we live up here in Michigan, and it's hot one week, and then it's 50 the next, the next week. I mean, we get a whole bunch of different temperatures, and from at least my knowledge, car battery technology, it changes a lot with what the weather is. I mean, I had a car battery in my car that was fine on Friday and then it was dead on Monday. And so I just, like, how is the batteries when it comes to the engines of the car, how is that going to affect, how is it going, how's the life of the battery here in Michigan gonna compare to the life of battery somewhere else where the weather's not as volatile? Uh, volatility usually isn't the issue. It's more of sitting in the extremes. Um, the, the good news is we, we've, particularly in Maven as an example, these cars are running 50,000 miles a year. They're exclusively DC fast charge. DC fast charging actually is one of the most impactful ways of, of charging the battery. Easiest way for the students in here, imagine pouring a beer into a cup really, really fast. And the goal is don't get that cup to overfill. 
yeah. right? And so you have to manage it. So the, the good news is what we've figured out from a lot of these Maven vehicles in those types of applications all over the country is that the battery is, is actually as robust as we anticipate it to be. So generally speaking, General Motors engineers are hyper, hyper conservative people. <laughs> and so what it looks like we're doing now is building a car around the battery where the car is going to fall apart and the battery is there. The good news is at the end of the useful life of that vehicle life, it might be 80% left. Now we can take that battery and turn it into another application, whether it's grid resource or other things that we can use it. So we're, we're pretty confident and our examples sort of show over and over again, even back to the first generation Volt, that the battery technology is pretty robust in, in most settings. Now you brought up another point, range does change. And that is a, a bigger deal. So if I get my 240 mile range in the summer, it might be 250 in the summer, turns into like 170 in the winter. And if, if you're managing that, we got to think about how do we do it, which means infrastructure needs to be there to satisfy. And people need to get cust accustomed to managing through that. So I, I think those the, the, the technology itself is in a pretty robust spot. The, the how to deal with that range differential between the seasons, I think, is something that we still, again, need to get people more comfortable with. So I'm going to take one more over there, but I but let's keep it, we're gonna keep both the question and the answer short so we can get in yet one more. Yeah, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm John Mullins. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, the podium says theory and practice and I took some time in the past year to actually take just a plug-in only uh, vehicle around Detroit and I live on 10 mile right here and I gotta tell you, you know, the range anxiety and the numbers that you guys are throwing out, in practicality, you know, what happens is that on 10 mile, there's a free charger at the library, you know, Novi Library has three of them. And um, I pretty much know that all three of those are librarians' cars and they're probably filled right now. And then you take it to a Kroger and the two people that are running the store are parked there and they don't leave. So now I'm trying to find the next Kroger, I'm trying to find somewhere to plug this thing in. And it, I was really excited because it's free, you know, it's free electricity, it's great, but when you're going through the planning, you know, if it's free, then it's also never available because there's no incentive for anybody to get out. You know, they can leave it there all night, day in, day out, and I know everybody's car. So I was kind of turned off because I, I kept on trying to find the next spot. And it's, it's hard, I don't know if anybody's tried to plug in only, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And so, in the second part of my question is, I didn't hear it in the States, but in a, uh, another country, they're really concerned about the disposal cost of these batteries, you know? And I didn't even hear it, you know, in our media, but that seems it's an overwhelming concern in other countries. Alex, do you wanna give a quick answer there? Uh, Big question. The, yeah, um, so so on uh, of charging availability, actually I'm totally with you. I think there should always be a nominal charge when you're charging, and I think it should be a really painful charge when you're not charging parked in the spot and plugged in. Um, and, and so, for example, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, you get to two hours, you're done charging, the charging station's now charging you two bucks every 10 minutes to motivate people in and out of charging spaces. So I, I think new business models are sort of emerging in that space. Free is always nice, but your point is a good one. Free is, is hard to find, <laughs> right? Um, on the charging technology, or, or the battery itself, um, it, I think we're all actively trying to figure out how, yeah, I say figure out, putting in the policies and programs in place to manage end-of-life batteries. As I mentioned before, um, I, I think the, the initial intention is how do you reuse that battery before you hit the recycle button on it. And don't forget that that battery's got a lot of really neat stuff on it that we still want. The difference, and to be very transparent, is we don't have those facilities within the United States to adequately do all that recycling. So the auto industry and other stakeholders are getting together to go, okay, how do we, how do we put battery recyclers next to, there's another section of, of battery folks who sort of accumulate the batteries and divvy it out and remanufacture it. So you got all these, these three cells on the Bolt battery all matching so we can repurpose it and reman it into things. So I, I think that the goal is, 
use it as much as possible before you get there. And right now we're starting to plan of when it does get to that end of life, how do you deal with it in the US? Sarah, Mark, Alex, this was fantastic. Your comments were so insightful. Your knowledge is so depth, deep, and this has been really fun. Mm -hmm. To Lawrence Technological University, thank you so much for inviting us here tonight so we could have this public conversation about a topic that we're all passionate about with an audience that seems to have been equally passionate. And last, to our audience, this is all about you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. question, would you uh, allow them to ask that question to you? We have four. Sure. Okay. Anyone Thank who you. needs to go. All right. Thank Time you. out. We're coming back if you want to stay. Four <laughs> questions. So I'll ask my questions as people flee. Um, between 1890 and 1920, the federal government, through subsidies and other incentives, invested in oil at a rate 10 times what we are currently investing in the technologies you're talking about at the federal level. How do you believe that this relative lack of investment is impacting each of your worlds and the work that you're trying to do? Okay, and we're making this like a, um, a speed zone, so we're keeping our answers crisp so as many people hear them as possible. The federal government should invest more money in transportation and infrastructure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I agree, but I also think it's important that we create normal, investable entities. Um, I, I don't want in 50 years somebody to say, remember when all those EVs got all those subsidies and they're now super dirty? I, I really do, I, I'm a bit of a market player in this. How do we create really sustainable market forces to drive that in into the system? That's not to say the federal government doesn't have a role to backstop and, and help so protect some of the risk associated with those investments. My question was how it impacted your lives. I'm trying to stay out of the politics and just saying that the absence of the money to go to your analogy, which was about making soup, it seems we're doing that without a stove. And just saying how does the absence of the stove It's harder, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just harder. I, it's just, Give me money, it's easier. Yeah, yes, we like can go do just, more. It's just, it's just more time in meetings. It's more time sort of doing analysis of numbers where it would be easier if there were more programs and funding available, particularly on the federal level. Um, it's just, it's, it's having to get everybody in the room and like these meetings, sometimes like it takes three meetings just to get to the real first meeting because um, everybody's coming from such a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Next question. Gentlemen. Oh, yeah. sorry. Thank you for the conversation. Um, as a student of urban planning, uh, uh, infrastructure like US uh, highway system changed how we live, created suburban development in 1950s, 60s. A big picture futuristic question, uh, EV or transportation mobility choices, do you see with new infrastructure with investment and if we idealistically build, uh, it will drastically change uh, how we live, shop, work, play. Mark, that one's yours. So I don't think EV infrastructure is drastically going to change much, right? Like it might change like how you fuel your vehicle and sort of you do it with something else versus doing an additional trip to go to a gas station. But I, I don't see it sort of changing like where people choose to live in the type of, and there's, if it's still, all single occupancy vehicles and EVs, it's kind of this, the same thing as today. Um, you know, autonomous is where you sort of start to get different, you know, heaven and hell scenarios that people will start to put out there um, because sort of, you know, pulling out the act of driving sort of creates all sorts of potential good and bad outcomes. Uh, full disclosure, I was uh, part of the GM electric vehicle program in the early 90s in charge of market assessment, figuring out how many units we would sell the EV1 and how big the <laughs> industry would be. The issues that we faced back then are identical to the issues you face today. Range, uh, equivalent cost to an ICE, uh, quick charging, um, dealing with a subsidized world versus unsubsidized world. So the, the question um, involves cost. GM had to pull the plug, no pun intended, 
on uh, the program or uh, rescale the program back then because the financials didn't make sense. We heard that Dyson has just dropped out of developing EV1s because they couldn't make the financials work. I am hearing uh, through what I'm doing currently, uh, any company involved with internal co combustion engines are not seeing any, any investments coming out of uh, the big three or any, any vehicle because they don't know where to place the chips. So how- Don't tell my floor. <laughs> How, how do you, um, how is uh, GM, since you're here, how does your investment in ICEs compare with uh, electric vehicles, and how do you figure out where to place your chips in the future? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, we've talked about sort of a, a new world order, right, of, of electrification, and, and I, I've been around the company for 15 years. I've been at the forefront of EV technology and other advanced technology for all that time. I've seen disparate ways of, of approaching it, but I can tell you the scale as which it's integrated into our organizational structure as well as the sort of product portfolio is significant. So rest assured, GM is betting gigantic amounts of sum of money on actually electrifying these fleets. How do you do that, right? You have to do that by making money. And to make money, what our best sort of versions of making money are in Tahoe's and Silverado. So a lot of folks look at it going, hey, wait a second, you're, you're sort of playing both ends of the spectrum here, right? We're not. We're actually using what we do really well to fund what we think we need to do in the future. Is, is a really clear sort of path forward on how do we go there. We need to make all of those archi that architecture work for a whole platform of vehicles across a whole big market segment. We all wish this was a sprint. I wish it was a sprint. I'd be rich if it was a sprint, but it's a marathon, right? Because of all the things that we've talked about are putting the pieces together today. So I, again, I'm defensive of it because I see the hundreds and thousands of engineers on my, on my team who are trying to figure out how to make this work and make it work cost competitively. I want to second what Alex is saying. GM is, has substantially reprioritized its resources to focus on EV and AV development. Those are big, expensive challenges, but we have really refocused our resources massively to prioritize those important long-term developments. It's not being starved. These are top priorities. And I'll just say we see that as external partners as well. You guys see all the activity internally, but from the outside, I mean, the amount of time we've spent working and thinking about this with you as well as it's right up in your strategy about zero emissions. Like that is one of the three things. And so I think that does send a strong statement. Thank you, Sarah. Last question. Uh, I don't know if anybody is uh, actually interested in this subject, but I would be curious to know how electric vehicles are going to reshape urban planning. I mean, I, I think the, the question is, you know, from a public space standpoint, how do you make that infrastructure work? So as I said, like, the, the transformer I saw was god awful and any urban planner that saw it and saw it in the middle of a beautiful park in downtown Detroit would just be like, we can never have electric vehicles if that's what it, it comes to. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, the EV infrastructure, would be, you know, so just look at parking meters, right? Like we, our city, like a lot of cities have gotten rid of the, the pole and the parking meter to go to the kiosk because it's freed up a lot of streetscape space. Um, if we have, gigantic electric chargers, you know, all, all across our every single street, like it's not going to look pretty. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's a piece. And then sort of also on just on the, you know, on the, the land use and the parking requirements and, and what we actually require developers to do. I don't believe in the city you have any sort of requirement on electric charging as part of a new development. Say like you're building a 300 space lot, you have to put X chargers. Um, I, I'm you know, that's another sort of way that we can sort of turn the lever as well. Uh, but I don't, I don't think, but compared to the amount of energy that planners have spent thinking about AVs, which are much, much further away, there has not been, I think, nearly as much sort of focused on the, the EV side. 
may misunderstand my question, so I have to restate it. Sure. Just to be clear. My question is, how are electric vehicles going to reshape urban planning? That's what was written on the program. I think that we've been addressing that throughout the evening. We've been addressing space. I don't think you came prepared to address the question. You're a number of planners, number of designers on your symposium, and I think you're also spiritual. No one can do it. But I can't expect to hear some of the thoughts here. Well, I'm sorry you're disappointed, but I think we've talked about important issues like equity, like environmental impacts, um, and so. I hope others have enjoyed it, and I want to thank everyone for coming this evening.